I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to Thorny Lee Golf Club. Uh, we're delighted to return to this exceptional facility on this beautiful, beautiful day uh, as we celebrate our 25th anniversary of the Athena Awards. So thank you all for being here with us. Let's give a round of applause uh, for, for Rich and Sharon and our servers who have uh, prepared a wonderful meal for us. Thank you. We look forward uh, to a wonderful weekend and uh, this uh, Juneteenth uh, holiday on Monday, a nice three-day weekend. Uh, we hope you have plenty of plans to celebrate and uh, enjoy this great weather that we are having. I want to uh, especially thank Eastern Bank, uh, who sponsored this program for many, many years. I like the uh, table of from Eastern to stand so we can all recognize you. Thank you very much for your support over the years, not just for the Chamber, but for women professionals and in, in the uh, professional world here in the Metro South region. Before we begin, please join me in a moment of silence uh, in memory of our past Athena Award recipients who have passed away, Christine Caravides and Marianne Robel Cox. Thank you very much. We encourage you uh, to enjoy this wonderful lunch uh, as we speak. That's part of how the program is working today, to use your time efficiently. Uh, so continue to eat while we uh, speak. Today, we join with communities throughout the United States and Canada to recognize inspiring leaders, specifically those who empower, elevate, and equip women to play a significant role in strengthening our community, our companies, and ultimately, our future. According to recent data, Americans created 5 million businesses in just the past 12 months. Think about that. Think about that. That's a lot of businesses. I mean, we lost some during the pandemic, let's acknowledge that, but 5 million businesses in the last 12 months, with 47% started by women. That's 20% more than pre-pandemic owned businesses by women, led by women. Companies led by women or with substantial number of women on their boards financially outperform companies with less gender diversity at the top. Firms with female directors achieve a higher level of innovation. In fact, according to the Washington Post and a new Pew Research Center report, women now outpace men in the return to the labor force. In particular, it is women with college degrees and younger children who have been returning to the workforce uh, in record numbers. Today, there are more women ages 25 and older with a bachelor's degree or higher in the labor force than any time before the pandemic in the history of the United States. Think about that. This shift in the college-educated labor force as women now comprise the majority comes around four decades after women surpassed men in the number of Americans uh, earning a bachelor's degree uh, in the United States. So women started getting accepted at a higher level, higher rate for four-year colleges 40 years ago. And they're just starting now to uh, outpace the number of men in the professional work world. However, the big question is, will the increase in college-educated women in the workforce result in more women in leadership roles? I mention this question as a reminder of why we continue to celebrate the Athena Award in leadership, especially leadership that produces more leaders among women. Printed in this, uh, one, on this wonderful award, just in the back here, is a wonderful quote. From Plato, and it says, What is honored in a country will be cultivated there. Careful of that. Don't want to ruin that, Barbara. I'm going to get that later on. <clears throat> Despite the advancement of women in virtually all industries, there remains a relative few who advance to the highest levels of leadership. Today, we are reminded just how important those who, are, who enable, encourage, and empower women really are whether they're men or women in the workforce. We are fortunate to have many strong women in leadership roles within the Metro South region. I would now like to introduce you to one, uh, and that is uh, today's MC, Sue Joss. Uh, Sue is a former board chair of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and is the chief executive officer of the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center. Uh, she has led the Neighborhood Health Center for more than 25 years, uh, where she has grown the number of employees from just a couple to over 650 uh, people currently. Uh, Sue is a past Athena Award recipient as well, and uh, please help me welcome Sue Joss as our MCP.
Thanks, Chris, and I'd um, like to welcome all of you on this beautiful day. This is um, my favorite event of the year when we're able to honor um, such a, 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 a well-deserved recipient. So um, thank you all, and please continue um, to eat. Um, we have a very exciting program for you today. We will present an exceptional leader with this important Athena Award and hear from another accomplished woman who is the Director of Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program at UMass Boston, Dr. Lori and Zaya Jefferson. I'd like to point, to the green, point out the green forms on your tables. Dr. and Zaya Jefferson will take a few questions at the end of the program if time permits. Um, please fill out a form with your question and please make it legible so I can read it. Um, and a chamber staff member or ambassador will be by to pick it up uh, during the program. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize some of our great leaders in the audience, starting with our ambassador team who assists chamber members through outreach and engagement. Please hold your applause until I've read the entire list. Um, Ambassadors who have joined us today are Mary Jane Anine from Combined Insurance of America, Mary Ellen Baker from HR Alternatives, Brenda Karens, Old Colony Elderly, Elder Services, Suzanne Fernandez, Northeastern Savings Bank, Richard Hook, SCU Credit Union, Catherine Light, Eastern Bank, Cadi Mascarenas, Brockton Redevelopment Authority, Joanne Schneider, Ambassador Committee Chair from Eastern Bank, and Felicita Sepulveda from the Cape Verdean Association. Let's give them a round of applause. I'd also like to acknowledge the chamber board members who are here today. Rich Hines from Barber Corporation, Joe Casey, Harbor One Bank, Ray DePiscali, Massasoit Community College, David Texera, the mattress maker of New England, um, and me, of course. So let's give them all a round of applause. Um, we also have some elected officials in the room providing their exemplary leadership in representing our community, um, starting with Shirley Azak, Brockton City Council, David Texera, Brockton City Council, Moses, Moises Rodriguez, Brockton City Council, Senator Michael Brady, Senator Walter Timothy, Mayor, Mayor Robert Sullivan, and State Representative Rita Mendez. Round of applause for the speaker. At this time, I'd like to welcome Ms. Abby Winberg, Senior Vice President and Team Leader for Min Women and Minority Business Enterprises at Eastern Bank. Eastern Bank, as Chris mentioned, is today's Athena Program premier sponsor. Please welcome to the stage, Abby Wynn Burke. Um, so thank you for to you and to Eastern Bank for sponsoring this wonderful event. Could you share a little bit about yourself as an example of how you have been mentored and, um, and done some mentoring in your career as a business person? Yes, for sure. Thank you so much, everybody, um, for your time this afternoon. Congratulations to the amazing ladies that we are honoring um, this afternoon. And so for those that do not know me, my name is Abby Wynn Burke. Um, as Sue mentioned, I am the SVP and team leader for Equity Alliance for Business, a new program at Eastern Bank um, supporting and elevating women and people of color owned businesses. And so um, I am actually very, very proud to say that Eastern Bank is an amazing company and institution where I've lived half of my lifetime 
working for Eastern Bank. Um, so in the last 20 years, in multiple capacities, uh, kind of going through retail, uh, managing a branch, and then um, the last decade with our business banking team, I've been honored and just really, really lucky to have amazing mentors and amazing managers who are both mentoring me as well as advocates. So I always had a woman manager leader that I was always saying, mm, I want to be like her. And so when I was in retail, I was a part-time teller finishing up college, and I had an amazing um, manager, and I said, I want to be her. And in five years, I was her, and I became a branch manager. And then when I came into the business banking side, I had a colleague that was just, uh, just dynamic and just really an advocate for the community, and I said to myself, I want to be her. And I was able to get to her in about five years as well. So there's always, having always somebody that you've pointed out and that you want it to be is an amazing goal. And I'm just lucky to have um, accomplished some of those goals. I will also just say, um, this past week we were at Emerge Massachusetts, uh, another nonprofit with amazing dynamic leaders. And one of those speakers were saying that not only do you want to get yourself a seat at the table, but making sure you're pulling out those seats for other women um, to sit next to you. So I would say those are the things that resonated in my career. That's awesome, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about Eastern Bank's Equity Alliance for Business and the reception you held recently in Brockton? Yeah, so Equity Alliance for Business is a dynamic program that we have uh, for the underrepresented like I mentioned, focusing on women and people of color entrepreneurs with all of their intersectionalities, including LGBTQ, veterans, and the disabled community. We service all of these entrepreneurs in this ecosystem in four different pillars. One is having an amazing, dynamic team, a team that is very entrenched in the community that we serve. Second is credit solutions, so different credit solutions where we were able to leverage the special purpose credit program loan to be able to do just a little bit more specialized, customized underwriting. And of course, entrepreneur insights and tools, connections with community organizations, and uh, uh, financial services and products. And so uh, last month, we had a very, very busy May month in celebration of Small Business Month, we collaborated with the Cape Verdean uh, uh, Business Association to be able to do an, a great event here. Thank you to the Thorny Lee team for that fantastic event, but the collaboration was led by City Councilor Moses Rodriguez um, with us. So. Thank you. Thanks, that was great. And um, last question, can you talk about what small business means to you at Eastern Bank um, as you look forward in terms of growth and sustainability? Yes, um, great, great question. So as I mentioned, last month was Small Business Month. So as a community bank, Eastern is deeply committed to supporting small businesses and their role in ensuring a thriving and local economy. And we prove that by being the number one SBA lender 14 years in a row. So really our approach is to really establish banking relationships that are rooted in equity. We know that it takes more than uh, capital for any small business to thrive. So that access to community connections and networks, it really unlocks those opportunities. So we're very happy and thrilled to connect with the Metro West Chamber to really unlock all those opportunities. Great, that's a lot of great information. Congratulations on all that you and Eastern Bank are doing. Um, so I have the Chamber pen as a token of our Thank you for, for speaking with us, um, and thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. Oh, pleasure's all mine. Thank you. All right, and thank you again, Abby. Um, I'd like to share a quote with you that I think is relevant for today's topic on leadership. It's from Mary Barra, CEO of General Motors. 
It's okay to admit what you don't know. It's okay to ask for help. And it's okay to listen to the people you lead. In fact, it's essential. The main highlight of today's program is the Athena Award presentation. Since the Athena program's inception in 1982, more than 6,700 individuals from over 500 communities around the world have been selected to receive the prestigious <coughs> Athena Award. Athena nominations are sought at the community level, and the award is presented to an individual, most often a woman, who has achieved the highest level of professional excellence given back to the community, and most importantly, assisted other women along their respective leadership paths. Indeed, this focus on mentorship of other women is what sets the Athena Award apart from other leadership awards of its kind. I'd like to reiterate that the Athena program is not solely targeted at one gen to one gender and that both men and women are eligible to receive this award. It is through a representation of balanced leadership that communities will prosper, and that, of course, involves everyone. So it's a pleasure to have with us today several past Athena Award recipients. Um, please give a wave when I read your name. Phyllis Ellis, NAACP Brockton Branch. <laughs> Janet Trass, the VA Hospital in Brockton. And Janet has just celebrated her 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Elaine Reiser, retired from Brockton Area Multi-Services. <laughs> and of course me, so. <laughs> Today's honoree will be added to the long list of distinguished recipients, and she is a wonderful addi addition. It's now my distinct honor to recognize the Metro South Chamber of Commerce 2023 Athena Award recipient, Barbara Arena. With over 30 years experience working with the Small Business Association programs as a 504 financing expert and an advocate for small businesses, Barbara Arena is the Vice President at Granite State Economic Development Corporation, where she works from her home office in Hanson with commercial bankers to arrange participation financing, which utilizes the SBA 504 loan program. As an SBA financing industry expert, Arena has been an active member of the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders and National Association of Development Companies throughout the, through the years, advocating on a national level on Capitol Hill to ensure the health of the 7A and 504 programs, delivering capital to small businesses. Barbara is a tireless advocate for advancing women in business and utilizes her over 30 years of experience to assist in leveling up the business of women throughout New England. Arena is a supporter of several business networks and advocacy efforts and works with state representatives to address local legislative and regulatory issues facing small businesses. Regionally, Barbara is a founding member of the Hanson Business Network formed to increase economic development and business growth in the town of Hanson. She also sits on the board boards of both the New England Business Brokers Association and the Realtors Commercial Alliance of Massachusetts, organizations that are active in enhancing business and real estate acquisitions, increasingly led by women-owned businesses, and, in fact, and affecting the impact on legislate, legislation of the same. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Arena of Granite State Economic Development Corporation. Congratulations, Barbara, um, and invite you to say a few words. Um, I really just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the people who have led me to this position. I am so honored and overwhelmed, Dan Trout, for nominating me, and my really good friend and colleague, my career mentor of sorts, Matthew Collins, who I've worked with for almost all of that 30 years. And, you know, I'm not going to add to that 30 years. It's just going to be <laughs> continuing over that 30-year period. But I'm truly honored for this award. 
uh, and the chamber for recognizing me. It's just, again, I'm just overwhelmed and grateful for this recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see Senator Mike Brady has something to say. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Usually it's Josh. Yes. <laughs> and we have a little recognition for you from the State Senate, and this is offered by Senator Walter Timothy and myself, Mike Brady. Be it known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Barbara Arena, in recognition of you being the recipient of the 25th Annual Athena Leadership Award offered by the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. This is signed by the Senate President, which is a woman. So, <laughs> Karen Spoker, uh, the clerk, Michael Hurley, myself. So, congratulations. You want to get in here, Chris? Go ahead. Come on, Chris. So we'll, we'll slide over that way, Senator Timothy. Sure. Put everybody in. I'm not as thin as I used to be. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. And then we also have another one for the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. And this is in recognition of the 25th anniversary of your Athena Leadership Award presented to a person who was honored. And this is offered to the Metro South Chamber for 25 years of the Athena Award. So the world will also come over here with that. Get in the middle right there. Say a few words in spite of your pneumonia. Come on back, Barbara. <laughs> yeah, so I've been dealing with a case of pneumonia, but I'm on antibiotics, so you, you can't catch it. Just you might want to stay alive. <laughs> oh, no, but congratulations, uh, Ms. Arena. A really uh, unbelievable background and pedigree, and we really thank you. We want to thank Chris and his team at the chamber. Um, I do have a citation. It's on my desk at City Hall, so we will get it to you. <laughs> I was running a little late. That's destroyed my life. Time management's not key, but uh, it's very similar to what Senator Brady said. Uh, but I am just so proud to be here today. The Athena means something, not just to the chamber, but to the community. So all the recipients, past recipients, and now future recipients, thank you for what you do to make the community, the city of champions, and the Commonwealth a better place to live and work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. You're truly an inspiration to the community. Um, and um, before we go on to our next speaker, I'd last, like to ask for one more rousing round of applause for our 2023 award recipient, Barbara Romina. All right, congratulations. It's now my pleasure to welcome our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Lori Nasaya Jefferson of UMass Boston. Lori Nasaya Jefferson is the director for the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at UMass Boston and graduate program director for the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Graduate Certificate Program. She has held faculty and senior scientist positions at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University, where she was affiliated with the Institute for Child, Youth, and Family Policy, the Institute on Assets and Social Policy, and the Sillerman Center for Advancement of Philanthropy. In prior academic roles, Messiah Jefferson has headed efforts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the Heller School and was the concentration head for women, gender, and sexuality studies for the Masters in Public Policy program. Dr. Nasaya Jefferson has served as affiliate faculty with the Health Science Society and Policy Program, Women, Gender, Gender and Sexuality Program, and the African and Afro-American Studies Department at Brandeis University. Nasaya Jefferson earned a PhD in social policy with a concentration 
and Health Policy, Health Services from the Heller School for Social Policy and Management, and a Master's in Women and Gender Studies at the Graduate School of Arts and Science at Brandeis University. In addition, she holds a Master's Degree in Public Health Services Administration from Yale University School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nasire Jefferson. Good afternoon. Because I am so tall, I needed a little bit, a little bit of help. So, and see, that's part of equity right there. We make sure that we meet people where they are. Thank you so much for your wonderful introduction. It was humbling. I would like to thank Chris Cooney and Catherine Schofield for inviting me to be the keynote speaker for this very special and wonderful Athena Awards luncheon event. I am excited to support professional excellence, community service, and assisting women in their attainment of professional excellence and leadership skills. Nothing could be better than inspiring others to achieve excellence in their professional and personal lives. And I want to emphasize not just your professional life, but your personal life is important as well. Before we begin our formal presentation, I would like us to recognize the Juneteenth holiday. What is Juneteenth? It is an annual commemoration of the end of slavery in the United States after the Civil War. It has been celebrated by African Americans since the late 1800s. Juneteenth gets its name from combining June and 19th, the day that Granger arrived in Galveston bearing the message of freedom for the slaves. The ongoing significance of Juneteenth remains important because blacks continue to grapple with the tension between celebrating freedom and justice and the continued struggle to permanently secure both. Juneteenth celebrates both. Juneteenth encourages us to celebrate our history, the realities of slavery, and what we still need to accomplish. And may I emphasize, we still have a lot to accomplish. Now, I would like to begin my formal presentation. The Athena Award was inspired by the goddess of Greek mythology, known for her strength, courage, wisdom, and enlightenment, qualities that are honored in the Athena Leadership Award. Athena was the Olympian goddess of wisdom and good counsel. War, the defense of towns, heroic endeavors, weaving, poetry, and various other crafts. She was depicted as a stately woman armed with a shield and a spear. And wearing a long robe created helm, a crusted helm, and the famed snake trimmed cape adorned with the monstrous visions of Gorgon Medusa. Can you imagine that image? <laughs> her skills and crafts signals both her practicality and her creativity and ingenuity. Her creativity helped her to be an incredible and shrewd strategist. The person who imbued these qualities, Barbara Arena, is recognized today. There is no doubt the accomplishments of Miss Arena were hard earned and well deserved. As noted by our host, her service to the community and her outreach to support other women to thrive and grow is, is the primary goal of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy. Uplifting women and those who support them through advocacy, policy, and law. We unabashedly utilize an intersectional and anti-racist perspective in all of our work. We accomplish this through offering graduate level education research on electoral representation, and on the economic, social, and health and well-being of women and their families. We value community engagement, including collaboration with ordinary people, the community, and legislative and congressional leaders. And may I also give a shout out to all of the political leaders in this room. I am so thrilled that you're here today, and that shows the strength of the Metro West um, Chamber of Commerce, Metro South Chamber of Commerce. 
As an African American woman, I want to focus on the, those who have inspired and uplifted me to address the persistent challenges that women, women of color, trans women, gender non-binary, and gender expressive um, people experience. That was a mouthful. I'd like to ask you to indulge with me for a few minutes as I provide where I found my courage, my intelligence, my warring spirit against racism, sexism, xenophobia, and other challenges. Who buttressed me? Who mentored me? Who taught me so that I could pour my spirit and heart and share, or dare I say, my brilliance? And what I mean by brilliance is my bright light with others. A gift from God that he gave me was the gift of intelligence, not intelligence, encouragement. And that is so important. We all need encouragement. And I hope to encourage and inspire you today. Shh. Listen to the quiet. Feel the soul. And when you feel your soul, you need to think about purpose. You need to think about healing. You need to think about mending. Songs of the Guller people. My grandmother, Lydia Hargrove Jefferson, was from Dale, South Carolina. A hop, skip, and a jump from St. Helena Island, where the Guller people lived. Guller women were intentional, and they were strong. The Guller believed that the dead, the living, and the unborn coexist. Perhaps that is also true of the process of thinking about women and claiming their seat at the table. Our ancestors are in our past, but they are also with us every day. The unborn signif signif signifies, signifies our possibilities and boundless potential. For black women writers, the trope of the ancestors has been a touchstone in their narratives. As Farrah Jasmine Griffin discusses in the introduction to the book, Who Set You Flowing? The African American Narrative is often necessary to invoke the presence of an ancestor or certain aspects of the past in order to understand the current and also our future. Griffin suggests that the ancestor is a pivotal component in the presence of women's lives. She states the ancestor is present in ritual, especially in how we see the world in our daily performance. Invoking ancestors is fundamental to the belief of the Guller. An ancestor fulfills the roles of comfort as well as guidance. My closest female ancestor, Lily Bell, my mother, was Southern born, East, and East Coast raised. She actually came to Newton, Massachusetts at four years old. She was an African American woman with brilliant passion, and it, her passion was to help the needs of children of color in a predominantly white school district of Newton, Massachusetts. There were 3% of blacks in Newton, Massachusetts, so she really had a challenge in front of her. As the MECO director, she led an effort to bus and educate inner city children in prominent suburban schools with high quality education. She advocated for, for their progress, addressed acts of racism and stereotyping against them in schools, and even developed the efficacy curriculum so that the children could learn their history. As we know, children who know their history will stand taller, be more confident, and are more likely to excel academically. She also created two college scholarships for high school graduates and beyond to attend the college of their choice. Lily was also a social activist with the NAACP, and I see the NAACP is in the house today. And also, I am a life member of the NAACP. My dad was a president of the, um, I think it was the Metro West region, and my mother also was with him in that journey as they went along. She was also connected with Church Women United, the National Council of Negro Women, and of course, her local church. We were dragged to church every single Sunday, and I can't tell you how long we were there sometimes. <laughs> she traveled and delivered, she traveled and delivered marvelous messages of hope and protest, particularly related to women, gender, and race in multiple settings. She co-created speeches with my dad for his city council campaigns along with protest letters to address the racism that we as blacks encountered in the city. For instance, now this is going to be interesting, uh, her and my mother, 
uh, her and my father wrote a letter to the police chief to demand an apology because a black man was arrested for using a telephone booth at 11 p.m. He must have been a criminal. <laughs> she also wrote poetry, drew pictures, and served on as many boards and committees as she could. So in a way, she could have won the Athena Award as she was a woman that was really a crafter as well. My mother, Lily Bell, was 95 years old when she passed. She was slight in stature, just like me, only 90 pounds, not just like me, <laughs> but extremely strong in temperament, skills, brilliance, and providing service. I barely cried when she passed because I found profound comfort in her indelible legacy. Her funeral was a time of learning so much about her. I heard stories and stories about her and what she did in the community. And one of the things that was really very interesting is that she not only claimed a seat at she she not only claimed a seat at the table, she took it and she owned it. As Shirley Chisholm noted, if you don't give if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. My mother didn't want a folding chair. She demanded a chair just like everyone else. And if I had my druthers, she would have had a throne. Not because she was arrogant, but because she was a queen. The kitchen table is the place where women in particular work and communicate with each other. It is a place to build coalitions between women of various ethnicities, races, and sexualities in response to racial and sexual exclusion from the main scene society. Our kitchen table was so fully connected to the work she and my dad did outside the house. At the table, they planned critical protests, legal and political strategies, community resistance, and also parties and community-wide social events. We did have a good time, even though they were working really hard. My father was the first black man to serve on the board of aldermen in Newton. He eventually was voted as the president. And one of the things we would always say is, when the mayor's out of town, we got a black man as the, as the, as the mayor. And that was really cool. Dad, along with my mom, also fought for fair and affordable housing in the city and a more inclusive community. They also founded the Newton Interracial Fellowship and worked with other local Protestant churches collaborating to bring racial equity to cities in of the city of Newton. Their efforts led to the foundation and formation of Newton's Fair Housing Committee, established to eliminate racial bias in home buying and rental apartments. Furthermore, due to my dad's efforts as an alderman, 10% of any unit built in Newton had to be affordable. Mom taught me that I could be both a lady and a strong woman at the same time. My dad taught me that I could accomplish anything, but I will have to put a caveat there. He didn't think I could pick anything up. He didn't think I could move anything, but I could be the president. So I thought that was really interesting for a man of his day. He provided, they both provided me with confidence and tools to disperse my dreams and my, and my ambition. These role models and so many other role models that were given to me gave me the impetus to understand the role of advocacy, policy, and politics to move us forward. And interestingly enough, I did not, I did not fall far from the tree, but neither did my son. My son is in politics right now, and he was in Congress for 10 years. And so one of the things that I think is critically important is that we continue to bring it forward. So one of the things I would say about my mother was she was considered to be wise and sensitive, an advocate, an administrator, and an elder. She was a womanist. I don't know how many people have heard that term, but she was a womanist. So what is a womanist? How does a womanist define herself? How does a womanist define and address moral, ethical, and social justice issues? How do we support and bring along other women? And how does she celebrate life and bring life forward? Womanist is a word coined by Alice Walker, an American novelist, short story writer, poet, and activist. Alice Walker's collection of essays, In Search of My Mother's Gardens, represented her personal recollection and sharing of wisdom developed through her activism. 
The definition of womanness is from women is opposite of frivolous, opposite of irresponsible, opposite of not serious, also defined as a feminist of color. When I read Alice Walker's definition of womanness, I connected immediately with that definition because again, we have to be serious because there's so much that needs to be done out here. It refers, it refers to a girl who acts grown. In reality, forward thinking and mature, who acts quick, self-motivated, or enough. What enough means is normally someone who wants to get into everything and enough is not what she believes in. She basically says, I am enough and I'm more, but you're not going to stop me. This young girl insists on speaking up, asking questions, rather than being content with the knowledge gained from the position of the passive listener. In the expression womanist, there was the echoing of the admonitions that I and other girls had received, which was, you're too grown, keep out of the affairs of adults, all the phrases were tantamount to mind your own business, nobody was talking to you. Yet, with that admonition, as women as girls, we still minded our own and other people's business as well. We did that with determination, with a consciousness grounded in care, concern, and willingness to step outside of established boundaries and norms and strategies to communicate and to inquire. Stepping out of expected norms, again, how do we move forward if we stay within the norms all the time? Have you ever heard the, uh, have you ever heard the phrase, boys are raised, girls are trained? Translated, this concept refers to an audacious, outrageous, in charge, responsible woman. Regardless of your race and age, all of you in this room can be, if you want to, be a womanist. In hope and transformation, a womanist engenders mutuality and community amid, amid responsibility and stewardship of freedom and honors the image of God or alternatively the essential goodness in all of us. Being a womanist invites one to live in the present while simultaneously being a student of history Engaging in radical discerning, listening, seeing, knowing, challenging, analyzing, and making a difference. Being a woman is, is a way of thinking and living that takes seriously the exposure, analysis, and transformation of social and political injustices and oppressions that affect those who usually matter least in society. A womanist utilizes an intersectional lens and values the knowledge of everyday people. And that's really important. How often do we take seriously everyday people? Um, and we need to know that everyday people create their own narrative and also profess their own needs. If a womanist is audacious, audacious and courageous, then to be a womanist is not to only engage in the easy dialogues, but also most especially to engage in the difficult ones. It means raising issues that maybe our mamas never would have raised or didn't know how to raise. We are obligated to move beyond the places of our displacement into the places of our discomfort, and thus to enlist the difficult dialogues. To reiterate, we are to name the unjust privileges that even we may be unwittingly complicit in maintaining. So this is the question you have to ask yourself. When you're doing the work that you're doing, are you doing work that's sustaining and liberatory? Does it contribute to the survival and wholeness of entire people? particularly people of color and other marginalized groups. Authentic knowledge is not which fosters any form of oppressive power. On contrary, one of the things we must ask ourselves is how are we maintaining power? How are we not, sh be not doing what we need to do to move forward? And then on the other hand, what are we doing to move things forward in a good, positive way? So one of the things I must say we must, as much as possible, 
be able to ask good questions. And this is one of the things I thought was really, really interesting as I was putting this together. Um, one day, a grandmother was talking with her grandchild. So she asked her, what did you learn in school today? She replied, I learned that Thomas Jefferson was a great man and the father of democracy. Mother replies, yeah. Did they also tell you that he owned slaves? While the girl was rooting for the Cowboys versus the Native Americans on a TV show, she tells her granddaughter, they may not be rooting for you. Think before you give support to someone. Think critically. So I'm going to close up in one moment. I'm not going to continue my remarks all the way through. But one of the things I think is important to think about is the fact that being a womanist also is someone who has moral agency. Having moral agency is not characterized by addressing the systematic and institutional forces that undercut the well-being of women, particularly women of color, but instead it is seen in the unfailing physical, emotional, and spiritual energy women have historically marshaled to engage in acts of resistance because of their oppression. Moral agency is then defined by efforts to frustrate and disrupt structures based on unjust privileges. Womenist work must not be concerned with securing privileges and places of power. Rather, womenist agency manifests itself as womenists firstly attesting about situations that do not support the well-being of the community, broadly defined. So what is it that leaders do? And what do leaders do that also pay it forward? We must remember that each of us is a leader, a divine original. We are crafted and created to make a unique contribution in life, one that only we can make. This is true for you, and it's true for me. That said, turn any obstacles in your path to dust once you focus on and believe in your own attributes. You have power to give that knowledge, wisdom, and power to others. My mother, Lily Bell, gave it to me. My dad, Matthew, gave it to me, and still does with his 99 years of wisdom. We have already demonstrated this. Even if people tell you you needn't try or you don't have what it takes, don't believe the lie. Release the known and embrace the new that we can go out and we can make a huge difference. Thank you so much for having me to speak with you today. Trying to get off the stage, but I guess I'm supposed to take Q and A's. So if you want to have a seat, we'll okay, ask them. So we still have chamber, still have chamber staff walking around to collect your question sheets. We do have about ten minutes for questions. So, well, thanks. That was amazing, and, and thank you for so much for all you do. And um, I had a question about your impact on the students at UMass and in your job, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, one of the things that I love doing more than anything else, is that, is that on? Good. One of the things I love doing more than anything else is, um, I don't think it's on, yeah. One of the things that I love doing more than anything else is bringing young women and people of color and others along. I like to work with students, to really get a sense of what do they want to do, what's their potential, and what are their passions. And so even though I am a teacher, I find I love being a mentor much more so than I love being a teacher. And I will say that our students are unique and our students are special. Our students are very, very diverse. We have students who are 22 years old, um, just finishing their undergraduate degrees, and we have students who are 65 years old and seniors just like I am. Um, and what really brings me great pleasure is that we can, with all the diversity in the room, really have students talk with each other and learn each other's perspectives and say that, you know what, we all have something that we can bring to each other. So for me, I think that's critically important. And also just leading, leading the center is a gift that I never thought I would ever have. So, yes. 
Great, and um, just to follow up a little bit more on the mentoring, what do you tell students about mentoring for themselves as a mentor and, and finding mentors? Well, that was a great question. I actually have an easy answer for it. We actually have a Distinguished Public Service Fellows Program within the center. So we have accomplished women that have worked both in the, well, in the private sector and also women who have worked in politics and in the nonprofit sector. And we match our students with those very, very accomplished women. In fact, I can say that we've had, you know, we've had senators, we've had representatives, we've had judges, we have had a number of number of different individuals. And so our students are lucky enough to be paired with them. But also what I tell the students is that you have accomplished much in your life and you are able to mentor others. And one of the things I want to say about our women in our programs, and we do have a couple of men as well, is that they come to the program and they have to be very serious about their education because they come with full-time jobs, they come with families, and some of them even have a second job, and many of them are parents. So when they come to our program, they know that it's going to be a lot of work, but they also are really, really dedicated to moving forward. So I tell them, whatever you've come to in this program, and whatever you leave this program with, you can mentor others. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question that says, what can you tell us about the Silverman Center? Interesting. Well, it's really interesting because I was at the Silliman Center and it's probably now been about seven years. So whatever I tell you about the Silliman Center will probably not be um, up to date. But I can say that I really, really enjoyed working with the Silliman Center and what I liked the best was that they were taking the time not only to think about, um, well, how do we raise money for the Heller School, but what is, what is the science of philanthropy and how can we make philanthropy better? What I focused on when I was there was really bringing more organizations of color into understanding and thinking about philanthropy and also speaking closely with philanthropists in terms of how can we address and provide not only more money and funding to women's organizations and organizations that support um, people of color, but also to begin to think about the way in which philanthropy is actually structured and how can we actually move forward in terms of becoming a little bit more innovative in terms of the work that we do so that we're not only funding um, organizations for short, short periods of time, but really making sure that organizations are set up so that they can continue to be self-sustaining over a time period. Great, thank you so much. Um, do we have any other questions coming in from the chamber staff? So thank you so much. Um, I'd like to give you the chamber pen as a token, and um, your, your comments were just awesome. We just really appreciate your, your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much, and that, that really was um, amazing to share your expertise with us. Um, all right, um, so before we close, I have a few chamber updates to share with you. On Wednesday, June 21st, we have a ribbon cutting at Binstar and Avon from 11.30 to 1.30. Um, Thursday, June 29th, from 5 to 7 p.m., Business After Hours at the Brockton Rocks, and that's sponsored by um, Luke Jackson Benefits and HR Solutions. Uh, for more information on Chamber events, please visit the Chamber website, which is metrosouthchamber.com. Um, so we have some exciting um, door prizes and giveaways to tell you about. Um, the first door prize is the an action report newsletter member profile and the winner of that is Zayas Andrade Brockton Redevelopment Authority. <laughs> and for all of these please see chamber staff at the back. Um, so we have um, four variety gift bags um, and those are provided um, by Eastern Bank, our today's premier sponsor. Each one contains a bottle of wine and American Express gift card, special farmer's market and Prova tote bag, and a regional restaurant week apron. So we have four of those in total. 
Um, first winner is Vanessa Laboisier, Mass Hire Greater Brockton Workforce Board. <laughs> Next, Michelle Fonso, CES. <laughs> Susan Murray, C Corporation. <laughs> and Paul Key, my brother's keeper. Um, finally, I'd like to draw your attention to today's table giveaways. At each of your seats is an Eastern Bank bag, which is yours to take home. Also, you'll notice at the center of each table is a bottle of wine. The person with the birthday closest to today is the winner um, of this prize, so enjoy. <laughs> um, so to finish up, I'd like to thank today. that for the end, right? Um, so I'd like to thank today's guest speaker, Dr. Nasaya Jefferson, the Enterprise newspaper, Ben Ross Photography, Rockton Community Access, the Metro South Chamber Ambassador Team, this afternoon's premier sponsor, Eastern Bank, Thorny Lee Golf Club, Chamber, and the Chamber Ambassadors. Um, and finally, let's have another round of applause for Barbara Arena, our 2023 Athena Award recipient. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend.